All right, welcome to the Elevating IT Podcast. My name is Mike Brooks. I'm excited today, really excited to have a special guest on the program with me. Uh, and we're live now. And David is David Hoffeld is my special guest. I'm going to introduce you, David, but I'm going to I'm going to preface this for everybody, for you and everybody listening. I didn't tell you this on our pre-show that we're in the middle of a thunderstorm here in Connecticut as we're speaking. And it was really loud about five minutes before you came on. So I'm hoping that, number one, the power doesn't go out in the middle of this. <laughs> And number two, uh, it, it isn't like louder, the thunder out there louder than me on here. So I'm going to ask for everybody's uh, forgiveness if that happens. Um, and I want to I want to announce, uh, introduce my special guest. So David Hoffeld today, um, first of all, is the CEO and chief sales trainer at Hoffeld Group. That's number one. And um, Hoffeld Group is a research-based sales training, coaching, and consulting firm that is a leader in the in using behavioral science and neuroscience, which is a scientific study of how the brain is influenced and formulates buying decisions to create sales strategies that drive buying behaviors and improve sales results. So he is also, and how I learned about David is by this amazing book. And this is now one of my very favorite books. This is on my very favorite book list, The Science of Selling. And as you can see, you can't see on the podcast recording, but this is a uh, earmark. Nice. <laughs> I have all sorts of post-it notes here with little notes for myself to remind me what I'm looking at. Uh, just a an amazingly researched book. And, and um, David, did I miss anything? And thank you for being here. Well, first of all, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, I've been looking forward to to our conversation, and I think it was a great introduction. And here's my promise to you, Mike. Uh, even though, whoops, can you hear me? Okay, I think yep. my mic just cut out. I said, uh, my promise to you is, even though it's raining outside, I'm going to bring the rain here as well in this nice. podcast. It's bring the be thunder awesome, and then, awesome. Um, Awesome, awesome. And for folks listening, make sure you comment. Tristan just uh, posted something on on the comments. I'm gonna I'm gonna raffle off some books. So at the end of at the end of today, I want people. I want to, I get this book in people's hands. So uh, this this podcast is sponsored by Audit. So Audit's gonna donate some books to some folks. So if you're if you're listening to this, and I'll remind you, make sure you're commenting here just to even say hi, um, so that we know you're here, and I can include you in the raffle. So. David, um, I I was telling you before, and I want to share this with everybody. I read a ton of sales books. I've, I've got sales books on here that are probably a hundred years old in my shelves, all you know, behind me and yeah. on the side of me. I got a whole nother rack of, of books, and so I'm a sales book junkie. I buy everything, and uh, your book has a a very uh, there's there's two things. Your book has an amazing strategy that I want to dive into and and you're really teaching something important here the sales equation and the six whys and I want to get into that but you're also you also make a lot of points in the book such as use emotion to sell right like little points like that and and I've read things in all these sales books and but your book is unique in that uh, people aren't going to be able to see this but you've got all these end notes with all of your sources you yeah. you're not just saying this you're you're backing it up with science, and, and I love that. Absolutely love that. Yeah, so. well, I appreciate you noticing that because the book took about ten years uh, to write because of the research. It's not a normal sales book. So to your point, in the back of the book, uh, we have over four hundred different citations to academic journals. So what that allows the reader to do is if you ever want to find out why we're advocating for what we're advocating for, I explain it in the book, but if you want to dive into it for yourself and actually see the research, you can do that. And that's kind of what we advocate for is a science backed approach. The reality is there has been now tens of thousands of scientific studies into how our brains form decision, why we perceive value when one salesperson offers us something and we don't perceive any value or very little when another salesperson selling for the same company, the same product or service, when they offer it to us, or how our brain discloses information, which is highly irrelevant when we ask questions. So there's there's so much research now that has been accumulated over the last few decades that I found as I got into it and just started dabbling, looking for little tips and tricks early in my career, uh, after I got into sales, just to help me be a better presenter. But I kept finding 
boy, there's more and more here that speaks to every area of sales and kind of helps us. We don't have to guess our way to success any longer. We can rely like many other professions on science. And when we do, we become predictably effective. And I think this approach too, not only does it tell you why you should sell one way versus another, but once you understand the why, Mike, what I found in training now some of the most successful companies on the planet is it also illuminates the how. How do I apply it? Oftentimes when we learn a, a traditional sales strategy, even one that, that is good, we can only use it very narrowly because we have no clue why it works. We just know, hey, when I use it in this situation with this kind of prospect, things seem to go well. But with science, it pulls back the veil and allows us to really understand why something works. And that allows us to apply it more nimbly throughout the sales process. And anytime you leverage science in your favor when selling and working with people, one thing always happens, and that is it's predictably effective and sales outcomes increase. And probably one of the most enjoyable things I've found in this way of, of using science is people like it, not, not just sellers. Right. Of course, they like it because they help them get results. But more importantly, buyers, because uh, put yourself in place of the buyer. Buying is hard, right? There, it's hard to make a decision when a sales professional comes alongside you and guides you through your buying process and is very client centric. And instead of conforming, trying to get you to conform to how they want you to sell or their sales process, now they're basing it all on you. And so it really inspires deeper loyalty and guides people through that buying decision. And we found it is an absolute game changer. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I, I mean, this is this is the this is stuff I geek out on. So I hope everybody watching and listening uh, is, is the same with this. And and really, it's it just helps us to to solidify what you should be doing. You know, when you have science to back that up, it's like okay, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I love it. Uh, I have to ask you, I didn't, you know, as we're starting here, how are you feeling today? <laughs> I'm feeling great, my friend. Uh, you're referencing one of, in fact, probably the most, one of the most controversial things in the whole book. Seems pretty innocent of a question, right? Right. I mean, there's some really interesting science that shows that when you start an interaction off like that, the majority of people, uh, over 95%, the data shows, will say what I said. They'll say something positive. And when they do, here's what the research shows is that they're now more receptive to a persuasive appeal. It naturally puts them on a more positive emotional state and it just sets you and more importantly, them up for success. So sometimes seemingly innocent questions like that, that go against a lot of what traditional sales trainers, this is an area they go, they don't, they don't often like, but there's such interesting research on this that using that simple little question, even though people may not like it, it's been proven time and time again in many studies to really set you up for success. And that's just one of the areas. I look at this science almost like an, an airline pilot will look at his or her instruments when flying. Sometimes their perceptions can be a little off when we're selling. And the same can be true when you're flying a plane. Sometimes up feels like down and down feels like up and terrible accidents have occurred. Tragic accidents when, when pilots uh, don't have access to their instruments or ignore them and go on their senses because the instruments tell us what reality is. And that's kind of what science is too. We all have perceptions. Sometimes we're right. Sometimes we're not so right. And the science kind of cuts through all that noise and says, here's the most effective way to engage a person. And you can look at that data and you can trust in that. And when you follow it, well, it makes you predictably effective. Right, right. Love it. Yeah, I had to throw that in there. I, I love it. I love stuff like that. It, and it makes perfect sense. It's like, you know, if, if somebody's feeling great and, and they're, they explain it, they're going to feel even better. It kind of triggers that emotion. So it makes perfect sense. And, and you talked about, you know, one of the things you talked about in the book is, is the issues with modern sales training. Um, aside from, you know, the other, you know, what we've already talked about, is there anything you can add to that? You know, I think lack of science is, is probably the answer, but I wanted to kind of dive into that a little, examine it. Yeah. 
Yeah, to me, that's that's the foundational issue, and it's very problematic. And I understand why it's it's like that. But the the problem I think with ignoring the science and just going off of best practices is uh, really problematic because w many times we are selling. You mentioned you have sales books that are hundred years old. Um, it's been a, an interesting study of mine too, looking at the sales literature over the last 130, 140 years. Here's the reality. When you look at some of those old books, though technology has certainly changed and our language has changed, many of the most common sales strategies taught today were taught over 100 years ago as well. Very little has changed. I mean, if you look at some of the old books from the 1920s, I can think of a couple of them, and you clean the language up and you put them on the bookshelves and give them a nice new cover, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference at all between them and the modern day strategies. The problem I have with that is if you think about what has happened in science since the 1920s to now, even in, with human behavior, how much more we understand the brain, we understand how decisions occur, we understand how a buying process occurs. To ignore all that, I think is just dangerous, especially when your competitors aren't. And the second thing is many times people figure out through trial and error what works and what doesn't. Um, many, many salespeople that I train have done that, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to cut through all that guesswork, right? Because the trial and error is expensive in selling because when something doesn't work, that costs you a lot of money and it hurts your clients, potential clients. So to cut through all that and to just leverage science and to get that insight that you can better serve those you're selling to. And that's kind of really how I look at this is selling is a powerful way to serve others when it's done well. And the science helps us do that better. And the science, this approach really focuses you on who matters in the sale, and that is your buyers. It's hyper buyer focused. And unfortunately, many of the most common sales strategies, last thing I'll say about it is, they're very seller focused. They're based on how I would wanna be sold to or how others in the organization, I, I'll just copy them because, right? But who is the focus on there? It's focused on the seller. The opposite of who we, I think we all agree, we should be focused on. And so a science-backed approach forces you to focus on those individuals that you're selling to. And that makes all the difference, not only for your results, but also more importantly for theirs. Yeah, I love that. And, and I want to underscore that, that the book really talks about, you know, it's coming from how we buy, not how you should sell. And and while you're talking about sales strategies, you're really focused on how people buy. And and you know, sales can be filled with these abrasive strategies, the old, these old things that we talk about, you know, where it really feels, and we've all been in that where you feel like, oh, I'm being sold now. Um, and they, they push it. What, you know, sometimes there's a boss, right? There's a sales manager who's forcing you to do that. So there may be salespeople on the call who are like, yeah, this is, this is awesome. But how do I convince my sales manager to not make me do this stuff? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So that gets to a little bit of what we talked about a while ago is when there's no why behind the how, this is what happens, right? When people, it's all anecdotal evidence. So, hey, I did this 20 years ago. I want you to do it as well. Even though it didn't work that well 20 years ago. And in today's environment, people don't stand for high pressure sales tactics. So I think one thing you can do is go in with the science. I have found that people are very receptive and you can get deep levels of buy-in to a new sales strategy when you say, hey, here's, here's what neuroscience says, or here's what a Nobel Prize piece of research suggests about how our brains form decisions. And hey, I was thinking about ways we could apply this. When you approach your manager like that, it's, it's not, uh, it, it, he or she is less likely to push back and you're not kind of trespassing on what they've shared. You're kind of sharing some science, right? And in our society today, people are very receptive to science. They're not as receptive to people's opinions. So when you come in and say, hey, here's how I would like to, instead of doing what you've suggested, I like to do this. Well, your manager is most likely going to say, no, let's just do what I suggested. Because everyone views their opinions higher than the opinions of, of other people. But when you can come in and say, hey, here's what, here's what the research shows on this area. And I was wondering, what if we would apply that? What do you think about that? Now, that's a whole different conversation. You can invite them in and collaborate around the science. 
And again, when you do that, it's a game changer. So if you want to get buy into a sales strategy, stop making it about you, my strategy versus yours. Make it about something objective like the science. Bring that to your manager's awareness. Invite them to collaborate around it. And most likely, unless you're dealing with a manager with really antiquated thinking, they, they won't take that as a threat, threat to them. They'll come into the conversation with you. And you're very likely to come out of that with some productive outcomes because what are you collaborating around? That science, that objective, verifiable evidence that's gonna guide you when you apply the science and they might have some good ideas on how to do that, you're gonna have a more successful outcome and a more successful relationship with that manager as you try to navigate that change. Right. So maybe the answer is buy this book, wrap it up nicely and give it there to your you sales go. manager. That's, so that's the answer to most questions. Yeah, there you go. Amy <laughs> says, uh, this is back on our, uh, you know, my original question of how you were, how you were feeling. She said that was interesting. She has a habit on the phone calls to introduce herself and say, how are you today? Most of the sales advice she's been given has been to not ask that question, yep. but I like it. And it's a hard habit to break. And Volker asked, uh, so how are you feeling today? Are there other questions like that, which probably leans into um, what I'm what I'm about to ask you, what I was about to ask you is really to talk about the sales equation and, and maybe get into the six whys, because that's where you're starting to really probe and ask questions. And, you know, we teach, and we've always thought that the sale is made when you're asking questions, as opposed to when you're presenting. So I wanted to See if you could share a little bit of that with, with folks. With, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So the sales equation really is when we talk about we want to sell the way people buy, that's not a new idea that predates me and probably all of our listeners as well. But how do you do that? Usually that's just a talking point we say in sales meetings and then we go out and do the opposite because, well, how do people buy? And so in the book, we share a very simple equation. And that is that a buying decision is a function really of two things we found. Number one is the six whys, which I'll describe in a moment. These are six specific commitments our brains must make for a buying decision to occur. So think of them almost as the building blocks of a buying decision. But that's not all as well. There's also, um, you mentioned emotions a little earlier. Having someone in a positive emotional state as well when they're making those commitments and making that buying decision also matters to our emotions are very impactful, not a new idea there, but some breakthroughs in the last 20 years in neuroscience have shown not only how emotions impact the sale and the buying process, and also perhaps even more importantly, what you and I can do. So if emotions matter, how do I engage someone in emotional level? What does science say? So I don't have to try to guess at it. So this first part of that equation, the six whys, so these are six questions that each begin with the word why that represent the mental steps all of us and all of our clients go through when forming a buying decision. So what are they? First is why change? So why should I even consider making this change? So until someone commits to change, they're certainly not going to buy from us. But that's not the only why we want to focus on in our sales process. Why now? Right? Let's say I know I need to make a change, but why can't I procrastinate? Right? Why can't I wait a few months a few years, right? A few decades. Why do I need to do this right now? Third is I call it a secret sales assassin that many salespeople get tripped up with. And that is why your industry solution, meaning why can't I do this myself? Maybe it's not as good what I could create as what you and your competitors are offering, but maybe it's less money. Maybe it's a first step for me. Why can't I just go around your whole industry? and create a solution on my own, or at least try to, right? Because that can be a, a silent sales assassin uh, that salespeople need to watch out for. So that commitment is key. Uh, fourth is why you and your company. This is interesting. Why, if I know I need to make a change, right? And I need to do it now, and I, I need some help here. Why you? And what's interesting here we found in the research is people judge the company by the salesperson. For better or worse, whether or not this is fair or not, doesn't really matter. It's unfortunately reality. And all of us can relate to this. Think about a time you were mistreated by a salesperson, a customer service rep, whatever it was. And you think, I'm never doing business with that company ever again. So this multi-billion dollar company, I'm never going to work with again because Bob mistreated me, right? But that's how our brains work. So what we attribute to 
the person representing the company, we attribute to the company as well. So that commitment of why they should move forward with us. And there's still two more. Number five is why your product or service. So why is that the right one for me versus other competing options? And finally, why spend the money? There's a limited amount of funds, right? So why should I invest in what you're offering versus something else? And I think the example we use in the book is someone selling software and, and the salesperson does a great job and they get commitments to all of the other whys except that last one. And the buyer says, listen, we need your software, but we only have enough money in the budget to buy that or some new machines for our factory, which I also desperately need. So now you're competing in this case, not against a traditional competitor or another software provider, you're competing against why should they invest in your software versus some machines that they also need. So how do you help them prioritize that? So those six whys, when all of those commitments are made, the buying decision almost always happens. And if one of those commitments is not made, the sale, the buying process breaks down and the sale never happens. And so if you think about all the objections you face when you are talking to a qualified buyers who have the means and authority to make a buying decision in your favor, and you think about why they have not buy, if you list those down, I guarantee you, you'll be able to tie them to at least one of those six whys, which means a couple things. In your sales process, you can proactively guide your buyers in committing to those whys. And if you ever do get an objection, you can go right to the root, to the source of that objection by identifying which why wasn't committed to, which is inspiring that objection. And then you can address it really meaningfully and head on if it ever does get verbalized. So we've had companies who have taken those six whys and applied them to their sales process and begun really guiding their potential clients through that process of obtaining commitment to the six whys. And just not only do sales go up, we've had people that have shared that sales cycles sometimes can get cut in half because they're guiding people through their buying process. How our brains make buying decisions can best be described via those commitments demonstrated with those six whys. Do you have some examples of maybe a couple of case studies to kind of put put that into perspective or, or kind of a real world scenario here, like, and, and that's a huge question, right? Like, I don't expect you to to do all of all of the six whys, but maybe pick one or, or two that, that stick out where you can kind of share a, a, a real world example of how you, you know, how you pulled them out or how somebody pulled those questions out and, and what they were. Yeah, I'll give you a couple applications of them. So we'll, we'll pick up uh, to answer your question directly. Uh, one of the whys, let's go with why change. That's kind of the, the first one. And though I presented them in numerical order, they don't always occur in that order in the sale. So selling, because people are messy, uh, selling is a little messy too. So people might walk in sometimes with one or two or three of those whys already committed to, and you confirm that. And then that tells you what you need to focus on then on the sales calls to begin to close that business. So one of the foundational ones though, and often the very first why you want to address is why change? Because until someone sees, at least has the curiosity to consider change, you will always be perceived as irrelevant. In other words, why do prospects go dark on you? Why do they ignore your calls or emails? Why after an initial conversation, can you never get a hold of them ever again? Because in their mind, the why change isn't compelling enough. It's not compelling enough for me to invest any more of my time in it. So when you deal with why change, we, what we recommend doing, and there's a, many examples I could talk about here, but it really is focusing on what is the problem that they have? Beginning to understand that problem in that what, what would create the case for change, right? So oftentimes change implies risk, right? So we need to draw out whatever problems they have and help them understand a couple things. You know, who is that problem uh, hindering? Um, what is the scope of that problem? And what kind of pain is that problem causing? In other words, so what? I have problems, Mike, you have problems, all of our listeners have problems. Sometimes we've had these same problems for years. They don't hurt enough to change. So people might have a problem and you might uh, identify that with them, but you wanna ask some of those deeper, we call them second and third level questions that really help your potential clients understand, not that they have a problem, but who is that problem 
how is it impacting them in negative ways? So what this looks like is oftentimes when you work with a, a new client initially and you're having an initial call with them, they might even come to you like, hey, we know we have this issue or you bring it up to them and they acknowledge, okay, yeah, we do have that problem clearly. But you don't want to stop there. And that's the danger many salespeople do. They go, great. And then they move on to the solution. You want to help them understand that problem. Not only does that help you when you present later on your solution to be really able to tailor your approach and so it resonates deeply, but also more importantly, it helps your potential clients understand their problem more accurately. And because you help them diagnose it, they're going to look to you to solve it. Just like when you go to a doctor, right? And you say, my leg hurts. Right. And the doctor goes, yeah, I get that. But if that doctor, he or she then conducts some tests and comes back and says, OK, here's why the leg is hurting. Right. And here's the problem. If we don't take this course of action, here's how that could evolve in the future. And you go, OK, I'm looking at that individual now. OK, help me. Right. I'm not looking at getting any more opinions. I trust you because, yeah, I came in knowing my leg hurt, but you help me understand that fully, the implications of that. What happens if I do nothing? Right. That's what a good doctor will do. And that inspires high levels of trust, loyalty. And that's what we want to focus on when we deal with that why change, because once we can get that commitment, all the other commitments are easier. So that even though I said they don't always go in numerical order, more often than not, why change is the first commitment that you need to get. Otherwise, it's very difficult to even get enough of an audience to get the other commitments. So be hyper-focused on why change. And when you identify a problem, don't just acknowledge it and run on and move on. You want to dive into that. Okay, what happens if they just live with the problem? Why is that a bad idea? Do they understand that? Because often people, just like all of us, when you have a problem, you live with it, and you just view it almost from a skewed perspective. Like, oh, yeah, we've had that for years. You know, it's not great, but we're still here. So you want to help them understand well, have they quantified that? Do they truly get what happens if you do nothing? Because early in the sale, that is your biggest foe. That is the biggest obstacle. We call it the status quo bias in behavioral science. When you think about it, when many of your potential clients don't invest with you, they don't invest at all. They just default to what they were already doing, which is nothing. And so that's what why change really addresses head on. Because once I can create even the curiosity for change. Like, yeah, this is worth exploring. Now I have a lot more runway. Until I do that, my runway is very short. And so why change? Identifying the problems and digging into that so you and they understand them fully and accurately and the implications of them is oftentimes a game changer once salespeople really start embracing that philosophy. Yeah, I love that. And, and why change? It's, it's funny, you know, people think about their competition as company that does what they do right but right. it's not right. necessarily that way you're competing right. you know first of all when you're marketing when you're advertising yourself you're competing against everything else in the news feed for yeah. somebody's attention and yes. until you can get that and that's where that comes in you know like they, they have to they have to actually want what you do first so yes that was a great explanation um well when you're doing this you know you talk a lot about heuristics i was i was looking it, I love that. I'd love you to define that for, for folks who don't know what that is and maybe how that plays into uh, what you're teaching here. Yeah. So the six whys are kind of our framework. Think of them in the framework of the sales process and the buying process because we want those to be aligned. So we want to make sure our sales process actively addresses those six whys, which is important. Well, how do we present to them? How do we gain commitments to them? Uh, a really powerful tool is what are known as heuristics. And don't let the name uh, throw you at all. They're very simple. These are rules our brains follow when forming judgments. And no one taught us them. They're innate within us. And these are quite powerful, I should say. Nobel Prizes, numerous Nobel Prizes, have been awarded to individuals who have cataloged uh, a, even a few of these heuristics. So they're very, very impactful. And heuristics are... What make us, you've heard people say things like, as human beings, we are irrational. Like we do irrational things all the time, which is true. But what's even more interesting is we're predictably irrational, predictably irrational, because you and I are not run by pure logic, right? But we are, our decisions are not governed by logic, but they are 
heavily governed by heuristics. So we do the same predictably illogical things all the time because we're using heuristics to make judgments. And heuristics are very powerful. They, they help us make quick judgments that are m m vast majority of the time in our best interest. But once you know even a few of these, which we talk about in the book and happy to share a few with you, um, it allows you to align how you sell with them, which helps people perceive more value and allows you to be more persuasive when you present. And equally important, oftentimes when people don't know these heuristics, what I see in the real world is they sell against them, meaning they don't leverage them in their favor. They try to go against them because they don't know they exist. It's not their fault. They just don't know they exist. And so they violate them. Anytime you do that, your influence is always diminished. And many sales, many sales have been lost, even in my own career. If I could go back in time and tell myself, my younger self, uh, a couple things about selling right when I first got in, one would be the six whys, and another would be a uh, heuristic that when I was young in the sales profession, I lost many sales to because I violated it. And so heuristics are extremely powerful, very actionable, and once you understand them, very easy to apply. Yeah, can you share a couple? You know, um, and maybe anchoring is one of those that we can talk about because I, I um, we we have this show is obviously sponsored by Audit. We don't, you know, a, a, from this podcast and the live is not about to try and sell sell Audit. It, it's this is really to provide value to the IT community, to to our listeners who are MSPs, and to help them elevate. The quality of IT to the small business and small and medium business market, uh, but this show is sponsored by Audit, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit of, of tie in here because I think it's really really important, especially because a lot of our users use this. We have um, a little box on on the Audit presentation just for your background, David. Audit yeah. is is a software tool that they'll use it to sell with, and they create their presentations off of that. And okay. we have this little box on there, which is a financial summary, and it shows where what they're paying today so they'll put in say a thousand dollars a month that they're that their current prospect is paying and then they the, the audit gives them a score so maybe they score 25 out of 100 there's a calculation that happens where based on that that audit score and what they're paying it could cost as much as four thousand dollars to get to a hundred with your current provider and what that's trying to do is create a price anchor mm -hmm. so that when you present your price it's lower. And, and uh, I think what you're talking about in this book really validates why that's important. And the reason I bring it up is because sometimes people aren't comfortable sharing that. And, and I wanted you to educate why that's so, you know, talk about maybe why that strategy is, is a good one. Yeah. Well, so anchors are a very, very powerful heuristic and anchors are uh, a very unique heuristic as well. Most of the heuristics are, once you learn them, you go, oh, wow, that's powerful. And when people experience them, they, they, uh, they recognize that as well. But anchors are unique in two ways. All of the research, and there is now hundreds and hundreds of studies on, on, on anchoring. And I'll explain what that is. But before I do, it's important to share two things all of the studies show. It's really interesting. First is that anchors are extremely persuasive. Um, they influence all of us. Second thing is everyone underestimates the impact that anchors have on them. Everyone. So even people in these studies, after the studies are over, the researchers will show them and say, you know, here's what we did this anchor and your, your, the results changed this much. And people will go, well, I mean, that didn't have any effect on me. I mean, people are gullible. I get it, but not this guy. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I would never be influenced. So anchors are one of those things that you can be very liberal with your use of because everyone uh, underestimates the impact they're having. So, which is really a unique combination when it comes to influence, where something is highly influential and everyone devalues the influence. They're, they perceive that it's not having as much influence as it is. So if, if you could design a strategy, that, that would be what you, you'd want to have have those two combinations. So what are anchoring? Anchoring is the reference points our brains use when forming a judgment, usually something of monetary value. And so in other words, if I were to tell you that um, I recently bought up just a regular stapler for $75, and I would ask you, Mike, 
regular stapler, $75. Was that a good buy or a bad buy? What do you think? Probably a bad buy. Yeah, a bad buy, right? We all we all instinctively, as soon as I say $75, I go, oh boy, I want to I want to sell David a stapler, right? Because it sounds like he likes to overpay for staplers. And so we all know that because our brains instinctively, naturally, uh, compare it to what we paid for a stapler last time. We've seen them advertised right. for, and we know it should be three or four dollars at most. Instead, he's paying 75. So we say bad decision. And our brains do that comparison point very naturally. So the power of anchoring is that's how our brains work. Anytime you show someone, here's what my price is. How do they determine if your price is good or bad, fair or unfair? They use an anchor. Now, imagine if you and I could control that anchor, or influence it, because it's going to happen anyway. So it's not like, well, I don't want to use anchors. Hopefully my clients won't. No, no, no. They will. Just like you did for the stapler. We all had the same response. It's a bad buying decision, $75 for a stapler, right? Because you had an anchor. So when we can help influence that anchor, they're more likely to perceive our price as really favorable. And there's been a number of studies. Let me just share just one real quickly on this. Uh, researchers, a couple of behavioral economists, gathered together a group of people and randomly uh, they would ask all of them, one at a time, what are the last two digits of your social security number? And people, some people had lower numbers, uh, one, three, two, four. Others, of course, have higher numbers in the last two digits, and they would say these out loud to the researchers, seven, eight, nine, six, and so on. So after they did that, they then showed these individuals, all of them, one at a time, uh, a group of products. And there were a bottle of wine, a box of chocolates, a keyboard, a book. And they said, how much would you pay of your own money for each of these items? They showed them no prices. They just said, look at the item. You can feel it. You can read it. And then you can decide how much you would pay for it. So people looked at all the items and they wrote down what they would be willing to pay. And what they found was really interesting. The people who had higher digits, who had shared higher digits of their social security number, they had said them out loud, were willing to pay up to 300% more for those items than people that had shared lower digits. What in the world is going on there? That is the power of anchoring. And I could literally talk to you all day long about study after study after study that shows the same thing. So all of us, when we hear things like that, we go, what? What in the world is going on there, right? It seems almost unimaginable. Why? What I said earlier, anchors are incredibly powerful and we all naturally underestimate the impact of them. So this is where you want to look at your instruments and say, okay, if all these studies, some of which are done by Nobel Prize winners, are showing that anchoring matters a lot. I want to leverage that in my favor. And so you want to be controlling or influencing the anchor, that point of comparison that others are using to compare your price to. And so what you shared is a great way to do that in the sale. Uh, there are many ways. I even have a client, he sells, his average sale is $600,000. And he goes into companies, does consulting. And so he would say, you know, one of the things we worked on was, about price, obviously $600,000 when he reveals his proposal is it's a big price. Now, even for large companies, it's a big decision. And so with that amount of money, he always gets pushed back on price. And he learned about anchoring and he came up with this on his own uh, after he learned about it and we talked about it. He just started almost by accident the first time when he, when he re revealed his proposal, right? He would get to the price and he made a joke. He said, he told me, he told his uh, clients the first time, he goes, hey, I promise I'll keep it under a million dollars. And he told me they chuckled like you did there, Mike. And they said, well, you better. Or they laughed. And then he showed 600000 And they didn't push back the way they normally did. And so they go, well, that was interesting. So he did it again and again and again. And when he told me about it, he had done it now a few dozen times. And he goes, David, it's the most amazing thing. I don't get back pushback on price the way I used to. People have questions, sometimes they have objections, but it's not like it was before I made that statement. Now, why would that work? Right before showing a $600,000 average price, which is what his is, he would say in a nonchalant, almost joking way, I'll try to keep it under a million. So a million dollars is in people's minds. Then he shows them 600,000 and that little anchor though it seems inconsequential and no one thinks anything of it, 
it impacts how we perceive price. So we're not, we're dealing with perception here. And our brain's perception is very malleable. A lot of things can influence it. So don't take anchors lightly is my recommendation to everyone listening and watching today because they are more powerful than you think they are and they will influence and even determine how people perceive your price. So you wanna be proactive before, before you show price, give them that point of comparison, whether that's what others have paid or what the ROI for other clients and their situation has been or what it costs with their existing provider if that's more than you, but you wanna influence it so that when you show price, that point of comparison will determine how they respond. And so take that very seriously because it's a very powerful heuristic. But again, you we all devalue it in our minds. But the reality is it works. It's incredibly compelling. And even inconsequential anchors, just throwaway comments, can literally determine whether or not someone moves forward or not. That's a great explanation. And for, for more of that, folks, make sure you get the book. Um, David goes into great detail on that and other, all the other heuristics and, and words really matter. Every little, these little things matter so deeply. And I just want to remind folks, make sure to comment if you came on late. Uh, you got to comment if you want to get in on a little raffle we're going to do at the end of the show. I'm going to give away some of these books uh, on audits going to uh, send you uh, one of these, one of these copies of the science of selling. Um, you know, I was, I'm, I've been rereading the, uh, the book Influence by Robert Cialdini, which is mm. like a phenomenal book. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I know you, you know it well. He just released the new version of it, right? Like he's got an updated version. Like every time he updates it, I buy it. Um, but, you know, in sliding into um, kind of jumping, uh, using that as a jumping off point, he one of the things I, I just recently read this, um, he was telling a story about a um, lawyer who does mediation between uh, you know, husband and wife getting divorced, right? And she basically goes back and forth from room to room and says, okay, here's what do you want? What do you want? And at the end, she'll come in and go and, and she'll tell them, you know, um, all you have to do is sign this and we have a deal. And she went to Cialdini and said, you know, this isn't working. Like they all, everything goes well until the end. And he goes, change around what you say and go in and say, we have a deal. All you have to do is sign this. And she reported back to him that all of a sudden it went to 100% of the people mm. complying. And it goes into, uh, he was talking about that in the chapter on on uh, scarcity. Mm. Uh, I think it was scarcity. It, basically, the idea that um, they people people want, um, they, they, they are more prone to um, give away something that they already have like the, then, so it, it goes into what you were saying about fear of loss and, and or gain, right? We, we mm. talk a lot about that in the book. Yes. People are going to buy based on fear of loss or gain. And Cialdini was basically saying like, people are more, are going to take action more when they feel like they're going to lose something. Yes. So what he was doing is saying, you know, tell them they have the deal, right? We have yes. a deal. Yes. And then mention that they have to sign and they're going to be more compliant and approve that. Oh, so that's I, interesting. I, it just shows, it just really shows how much all this little stuff yeah. matters. Yeah. Well, it's powerful. He's spot on. I mean, there's so much research on fear of loss. And what the, the research has shown that it's twice as powerful as desire for gain. Um, so it's a two to one ratio. And right. that's something. And that's the great thing about having understanding some of these principles. It allows you to do like what he did. He, he used that principle and said, okay, how can we trigger loss aversion in that statement and that's going to make people don't like the threat of losing something and that and that's a powerful reminder for us in selling as well the two things i always share about loss aversion and, and desire for gain first with desire for gain salespeople are naturally talk about desire for gain in almost every sales process i've ever seen the problem is they don't contextualize it they do generic desire for gain so what i would say what i found can amplify the impact persuasive impact of sharing desire for gain is customize it to your potential client. In other words, you want it to resonate and speak to their situation so much that you couldn't use those same phrases with your next client. So it's so tailored for them because what the research on this shows, which is really interesting, this is from a number of surveys that were done. When you ask buyers 
Um, do the salespeople you work with understand your problem enough that can help you solve them? Majority of them, so 77% of them say no. Now, when you talk to salespeople, those same salespeople who are selling to those same buyers, and you say, do you understand your buyer's problem enough to be able to help them solve it? Uh, they always say, yes, absolutely. I understand the problem more than they do sometimes. They'll say things like that. So the perception from buyers to what the sellers are doing isn't there. There's a disconnect. And often that disconnect is because salespeople present very generically. They present, this is going to save you money. No, how much? Right? This is going to alleviate this issue. How? And what is the issue? Who is it affecting? Get specific with it. That'll amplify the impact of that desire for gain. When it comes to loss aversion, the biggest thing and recommendation I have here is to use it. Usually loss aversion is only talked about in sales meetings and sales trainings, right? Then we, we go off and say, yeah, it matters. And then we go off and we never leverage it. So with loss aversion, the way to do that so it's simple is to think about what does your potential client stand to lose? Is it monetary? Is it market share? Is it efficiency? Is it morale? And with their employees, what do they stand to lose if they don't invest in your solution? And then help them quantify that, bring that to life and get that to their awareness, right? And the thing with fear of loss is you want to always show how they can alleviate it. That's what also the research on fear of loss shows. If you just create fear of loss and you move on, it, it doesn't change behavior. Our brains just ignore it. And they go, well, I get it, but I don't know what to do. So you want to then present a really crystal clear path on, and that's what our solution is set up to do to make sure this doesn't happen, right? And make it a very crystal clear. So leverage fear of loss, think through, what do they stand to lose if they don't move forward? Bring that to their awareness, get buy-in, to it, invite them into that dialogue, collaborate around it, and then give them a very clear, I mean, spelling it out for them, I always say, so like if a third grade child is in the room listening, they would get it. They go, oh, okay, that's a way to avoid that. So, you know, keep it, the technical jargon, and when you get to this part, make it simple, um, remove all the friction so the path is um, unen unencumbered and very easy for them mentally to get through so they see how, okay, there's fear of loss here. You trigger it, and then you can avoid all that. And when you do that, it's extremely compelling. And so when salespeople start embracing, you know, contextualizing desire for gain and using fear of loss effectively and not running away from it or ignoring it, but actually using it, it is those two, that, those combinations, using both is very, very powerful. And if you do it well, clients love it. Who doesn't want to get something from it, especially when you can, contextualize it for me. And I don't want to lose something that matters to me. If you bring that to my awareness and show me how to avoid that, I'm, I'm all ears. I mean, I'm, I'm in, I'm interested. And now my loyalty and the life that I'm going to go with you is extremely high because, you know, you're helping me avoid losses that I don't want to experience. So using them is mission critical. All right. So David, this is awesome. I could, I've got like 18 more questions I could ask. We got to go for another hour. This is a, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to start winding it down. I promise I'll let people go. Uh, but this has been fantastic. And you, you kind of led into it in, in your last answer um, a little bit, but I, I want to play the part of the IT guy now, you know, our, 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 our listeners, the folks who watch and listen to this primarily are um, IT providers. They, they're outsourced IT providers called MSPs. Um, they're very technical by nature. A lot of them, our engineering background. Um, so I just, you know, I, I, I probably have to ask on their behalf, you, you definitely want to throw as much technical details into your presentation as you can, right? So that we, we give them all the technical data and, and forget about that emotion stuff, right? Right, right. Not, not necessarily. So <laughs> here's the way you want to think about this. And this can be challenging for anyone who's an expert in something. So whether it's an IT professional or uh, even me, I struggle with this too, right? Because I get excited and I can literally talk all day. Sure. I, I have uh, at times on some of these ideas. And so what you want to think about though is, so a science back perspective, as we mentioned earlier, is hyper buyer centric. And so you want to think about what information do my buyers need to know to make this decision? Maybe there's 10 data points that I would love to share with them, but really all they need to know to make this decision is three. I'm going to keep the other seven in my pocket. If a question comes up or they need clarification, I might disclose them then if needed. But I want to start asking myself, not do I, what do I want to share? 
but what do they need to know to make this decision? And when you start asking that kind of question, what you'll realize is less will help you sell more. And there's all kind of research on this that shows when even product selection, when companies that offer a lot of products, when they narrow their product scope down, buying behaviors go up, right? It's very difficult to choose from 20 options. It's very easy to choose from four, right? And so when there's friction in the buying process, people are less likely to do it. So we want to make simplify it. So less will help you sell more. And so then you have to ask yourself, what is the goal of this interaction? Is it to help this, these individuals make a decision or is it for me to showcase all I know? If it's for you to showcase all you know, well then tell all 10. But if your goal here is to really help these individuals make a decision, what data points do they need to know to make a good decision? And then those are the ones you wanna focus on. And when you do that, buying behavior will always go up because now you're conforming how you're presenting to what people need to buy. And that can also be a game changer. Oftentimes simplifying a sales process and removing a lot of the unnecessary clutter, though it hurts, I get it, it hurts and you're like, oh, I wanna share this. But if they don't need it, then who are you sharing it for? Well, you. And again, that's the opposite of what we wanna do. We wanna be buyer centric, not seller centric. So making those changes, though I know those things in, in the moment, I promise you, it will it will improve your results, and more importantly, again, it will help your potential clients make a good decision that they'll feel great about. Awesome, that's a great way to to sort of leave it off. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a few comments up uh, in case you have a comment on the comments here. Team Logic from Lafayette uh, says anchors away, and Chris says he loves the concept of the anchor. Thank you for that. And Tristan had a question: uh, would it would be interested if the book helps? more when client doesn't give their pains when asked? Yeah, so we get into, in the book, we have a whole chapter on asking questions. We have a level of questions. And really the strength of it is those follow-up questions. So what do you do after you ask? Because all of us have those initial questions we go into the sale with, and uh, that's great. That's what we call them first level. Those are good, but where great salespeople live is in usually in that second level of questions, which are really helping your potential clients explain a first level response or assess, uh, let's say like a value proposition or an idea. And when you can start asking those questions, and so when you learn that model, it's simple enough that it allows you to be nimble. The problem I found a lot of times with the, the traditional questioning models is, you know, there's just nine types of questions and it's like, well, good luck using that because you need to think about what the person you're talking to is saying and think, okay, which of these nine uh, you know, levels of questions am I gonna use or types of questions? And those two things aren't gonna happen. Your brain can only focus on one thing at a time. And so we have a layered style. There's only three layers and they happen naturally. So when you go to a dinner party and you have a great conversation with someone and you walk away learning all kinds of interesting things, uh, you were using the layered question. It's how our brain discloses information. So it's not hard to learn. In fact, it's very easy. But once you learn it, you can then utilize it and it naturally helps people disclose information. And when you use those questions well, not only does it help you know what to say, what kind of follow-up questions, but what the research shows is really interesting. When you ask second level questions, they've hooked people up to fMRI machines that measure brain activity when they're being asked these kind of questions. And the pleasure centers in the brain uh, associated with reward and pleasure light up. So people enjoy being asked these kinds of questions. So when you learn that model, it is a game changer in how you ask follow-up questions. And as all great salespeople know, that's where the money is. It's your ability to ask high gain follow-up questions in the moment and customize them to the person you're talking to. That's really gonna set you up for success in everything else we've talked about today. So I think it's a mission critical skill. So yeah, we talk about that in the book. Look for, I think it's chapter five or six uh, on the levels of questions. It's great stuff. So as we wrap up here, uh, I'm gonna tell you, I, I'm gonna ask you, David, to, to let people know how they can learn more about you. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about your next book. I'm excited about that. Tell everybody about that. But uh, for folks who are watching, if you're still here, 
make a comment so I know you're here because we got about, I think we had about eight people comment so far. It's a good chance of winning a book. I'm going to give that away as soon as David is done answering that question. Yes, yeah, so you can get in contact with us and learn more about this science back way of selling. Go to huffeldgroup.com. It's H-O-F-F-E-L-D group.com. There's a lot of resources there that are at no cost. We have uh, a popular podcast you can check out as well anywhere where you consume podcasts. Uh, check that out too called The Science of Selling, not surprisingly. And then, of course, the book by the same title as well. You can check that out. So, and then uh, the next book comes out in March 22nd of next year. And this is kind of a nice companion piece to the science of selling where we talk about really what does science say regarding how each of us can sell more? We get in the mindsets, we get in the uh, goals. What does science say? And there's a lot of research on this. I think in the chapter on goals, I believe I cite about 200 different studies in the chapter with citations. So it's heavily researched on the seven things you can do to make it much more likely. And I mean a lot more likely you'll achieve any sales goal or really any goal. We also get into some uh, behaviors on how to, that science says will make a huge impact on your sales performance. And then we get into the last chapter, probably my favorite chapter in the whole book. We talk about how do you take your career to the next level? And we deconstruct that into really actionable four steps you can take right away to take your career from good to great or great to exceptional. So if you want to take a major step forward in your career, it's kind of the, the blueprint for exactly how to do that. So the book is called Sell More with Science. It'll be available next March. But if you like the science of selling, I think you're going to love this book. It's much a lot of exercises in it as well, heavily focused on application of the science, even more than the science of selling was. So definitely mark your calendars and check that book out. Cool. All right. With that said, thank you very much. I'm going to see if I can uh, share. Let's see. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if I can do this and give away some books. Okay. So, all right. Who's ready to win a book? Let's see. I think I do it this way. Yeah, this. Here we go. Volker is going to win a book. All right. I'm going to remove you from the list, Volker. And now I'm going to, I'm going to spin it a couple times here. I'll give away a couple books. So if you win one, you've got to um, email me, mike at auditforit.com. Email me your address. I can send it to you. Amy. Woohoo. Awesome. All right. Amy wins. I'm going to remove Amy. Well, let's do one more. One more book. Amy, make sure you email me. It looks like Tristan Bailey is going to get a book. So cool. Congratulations to our winners. <laughs> I love the little, uh, I don't know if you can hear the applause, but. Uh, that's awesome. I heard it. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, everybody, for watching. David, thank you so much for um, for being here. This was an uh, absolute uh, privilege for me. I, I, like I said, I could, uh, could I could ask you questions for, for the rest of the day. So we'll leave it at this. Thank you again, everybody. Have a great day. And uh, until next time, keep elevating IT.